All right, here we go. Are you covenanted? Part 52. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a quick review reset of where we've been. We just went through quickly, set a rabbi record of going through four chapters in one teaching. Never to be done again, never done before. No, I'm kidding. Okay, but we got, went through the first four chapters of the letter to the Hebrews. Let me go ahead and look again real quickly at a couple of bullet points to remind us of what we learned. First of all, we were setting the context, okay, so that we could eventually understand what was going on in chapter 7 and into 8, but the idea of verse 22 of chapter 7, by as much as this Yeshua has become a guarantor of a better covenant, because that's a problematic verse if we could ever say so. That's a verse that Christianity has used to do away with the Old Testament and all that kind of stuff. All right? So, and we will get to that most likely um, today if we can. Otherwise, it'll be next week. But that's where we're headed, to understand the context that that verse fits into. Okay, so in the first four chapters, we see that there's a case being made for Yeshua's place in the big picture and in the lives of the individuals that are being talked to here in this letter. Now, bear in mind, like we talked about last time, this was not written to you, but it was written for you, okay? But so you can understand and put yourself in the shoes of the people it was written to. So part of the context is that the writer, who has, I didn't, I didn't write this in my notes, but remember, the context here is that all of what they understood, all of the people that are reading this letter, everything that they had a context for was about to go bye-bye. Okay, the Romans were now surrounding Jerusalem. There was a siege going on, and this was all about to get wiped out. Their whole, see, it's hard for us to relate to this. We are living in 2019 USA. Some of you in whatever country you're watching this in or whatever, but you don't have the context of like a nation putting you in a siege what does it mean to have your place surrounded by an army, have supplies and, and water and other things cut off so that they could starve you to death or, or have you just die of whatever? We're not, we don't understand that. We don't see that much anymore. We also have not had, in a long time, life as we know it wiped out. Now, there are some nations in the world that are still going through those kind of things, but most of us have never experienced that. And so these are people who are really concerned. I think that's an understatement. They are freaked out, panicked. What are we going to do when all of the things that are our anchors, our stability, our reference points are about to go and get wiped out? And that's the temple system primarily. The structure of their society, the Jewish society, was centered around the priesthood and the temple system. So the writer of the letter is making a case for Yeshua's place in the big picture, in other words, where he's always been and where he belongs, and also individually in their lives, specifically Yeshua as high priest, which is a critical understanding for the rest of the book. They're trying to make a case for Yeshua as, as high priest. And they've introduced this idea of this separate priesthood that is mentioned almost zero in Scripture, this Melchizedekian thing. It's only mentioned a few times prior to these references here in Hebrew. And so the people weren't thinking much about the Melchizedekian priesthood. They were only concerned about the Aaronic, the Levitical priesthood. And so... There's a case being made that there's another priesthood because, after all, Yeshua does not qualify to be an Aaronic priest. He'd have to be a son of Levi, a son of Aaron, down through that generation. He does not have that. And so the comfort that is supposed to be coming from the writer is coming from saying there is a priest and a system that still exists that you can be a part of that will handle all the things that the Aaronic priesthood handled, except, of course, the sacrifices, because there won't be a temple to use for those things. And so we're being introduced to Yeshua, the high priest. Now remember, most of what the other writers and other witnesses, remember that's really what they call themselves, they were eyewitnesses to the things Yeshua did, were making the case for him as Mashiach. They were not making the case for him as high priest. It's not talked about at all, really, in the Gospels. 
This is a, a new distinction that's being made to the people who are now experiencing. Because remember, when Yeshua died and was resurrected, the temple and system continued on very nicely for another 30 years. Another 40 years, okay? And so there was really no need to make this point at that point. But now it was critical to the understanding of this particular group of people, the role of Yeshua as high priest. Now, okay, and then it says, us, in one of the verses, it tells us that we are to closely consider the emissary and high priest of our confession, Messiah Yeshua. So that's the groundwork for the rest of the book, is that we are closely considering this entity, this being as the high priest and emissary of our confession. We are told that Elohim distributes the gifts according to his own desire. And that's not so important from a charismatic, whatever Christian mindset. Oh, because as soon as you see gifts, everybody's thinking of themselves. No, he's talking about here that he decides that Yeshua is high priest. He decides when he decided that Aaron and his children would be high priests of the Levitical line. He is choosing who had the authority to be the one in charge of making the tabernacle materials and putting the building together. Okay, so this is him distributing gifts. In other words, calm down. You don't get to decide how this needs to work. But we need it to be a Levitical thing and this and that. Well, he's already got something else in place and he's chosen it to go this way. You need to be in line with what he's decided. So he distributes gifts according to his own desire. Yeshua's qualifications are beginning to be listed in this sections that we read already. So they're starting to give us some idea of his qualifications for the position. A case is made for Yeshua being more, this is important now, more esteemed than Moshe. This is not in any way, though, written in a manner that should diminish Moshe. So Moshe is in this high elevated place. He is not lowered at all. Yeshua is just placed above. Okay? Very important because those who read this and push it through Christianity's sort of agenda, they push Moshe out of the picture as opposed to just elevating Yeshua above. All right? So cases made for Yeshua being more esteemed than Moshe without in any way shaming or disrespecting Moshe. A caution is made that we should not make the same mistake as those who are unable to enter the land because of unbelief and disobedience. So, as he's going to go forward and explain this new understanding, this Melchizedekian priesthood, this high priest Yeshua of that line, he's going to say, look, do not make the mistake they made. They were brought into the line of Aaron as priesthood. They were brought into this structure with the temple, and they didn't obey. They didn't follow Torah instruction. They didn't submit to the covenant, which is what? I speak, you do. You listen, you hear, you do. You shema. He said, don't make that mistake. The verses that go out there, he says, look, do not do what they did. They were laid low. They did not make it into the land because of unbelief and because of disobedience, which, by the way, belief is going to demonstrate whether you are obedient or not because that's the way we know. Your behavior is going to demonstrate either belief or unbelief. And so this is really critical that we see those things together. A case is then also made that there is a linkage to belief obedience and Yeshua to entering into his rest. So he talks about entering into the rest and a Sabbath keeping for those that believe. And there's this linkage between our belief in obedience and Yeshua and the rest. Because remember, they're all freaking out and they're panicking because they're under the siege and they've got anything right now but rest. Nobody is sleeping. Nobody's getting any rest. Everybody's in full, highest level of panic and stress that you could ever imagine. Okay, imminent death is surrounding them. You think it was bad when they saw the chariots? It's the same idea, right? The chariots are coming. There's mountains on one side. There's chariots on one side, and there's the water on the other. They don't see any way of escape. Well, guess what? Similar thing here. The, Jerusalem is surrounded. There is no place to go. They, are, they understand we are going to die. And if we don't die, we're going to be captured, and the system that we're used to living under is going to die. And so they're under, they have no rest whatsoever. They are completely without rest. Okay, so that context now brings us to chapter 5. 
And it's important each week we're going to kind of do this as we go through the book of Hebrews until we finish Hebrews because you're not going to be able to remember what I'm saying in chapter 5 or 6 if you don't have that reset because you've had your whole life, which is a 2,000-year indoctrination process of which you got the last 20, 30, 50, or 60 years of, of trying to convince you about what Hebrews is talking about. So you're going to need to be, you know, having the new idea swim upstream against all of that. So I need to keep hitting and resetting it for you, okay? So now let's go into chapter 5. So this chapter is going to begin to make the case for the differences between the Melchizedekian and Levitical priesthoods. Okay, the differences between the Aaronic Kohanim, the Aaronic high priest line, and Yeshua being high priest of Melchizedek. Chapter 5, verse 1. For every priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in matters relating to Elohim to offer both gifts and offerings for sins, being able to have a measure of feeling for those not knowing and being led astray, since he himself is also surrounded by weakness. So what he's saying is, look, the human priest has empathy. He knows what it's like to be a human being. He knows what it's like to have the failings and temptations that you do. Because remember, the priest offered up these offerings for sin, for forgiveness of sin, for himself, and then also for the people. This is done individually when you would come to make your offerings. It was also done once a year for the whole nation. And it says here, look, these priests that are in the Levitical priest line that are taken from among men, they are able to know because they are human beings themselves. He says on verse 3, and on account of this, he has to offer for sins as for the people, so also for himself. And no one obtains this esteem for himself, but he who is called by Elohim, even as Aaron also was. In other words, you don't get to self-appoint. Okay? In other words, they had to go, in this particular case, through the line of Aaron. Through the line of Aaron. He says, so also... Take the framework, what we just said. He says, now there's a so also, which means in like manner as, just like what I just said, so also the Messiah did not extol himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, you are my son, today I brought you forth. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and petitions with strong crying and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his reverent fear, through being a son, he learned obedience by what he suffered. Now, when he says he learned obedience, in other words, it's not like he learned obedience, but again, this kind of like take it back to the idea of submission. Submission doesn't come into play, what? Until you don't want to do or you don't agree, or you don't like. So when he said, Father, if it is possible to take this cup from me, he was expressing, I don't know that I really am going to enjoy this very much. But yet he said, nevertheless, your will be done. See, that's where he learned obedience. Very easy for him to obey when everything was wonderful. Very easy for him to obey. Same thing with wives with their husbands uh, and men with upper, you know, whatever vertical alignment that you're part of. Easy to follow and submit to whatever authority you're under when you agree with them. You learn obedience when you don't. Because there's no obedience issue when you agree. You're right there ready, running to go do if you agree. You're an, you're an, an eager participant as opposed to a reluctant or belligerent or, you know, resistant participant. So it says here that Yeshua learned obedience. He didn't learn to obey like he didn't understand obedience. He learned what obedience really was to someone that was going to be challenged because there were no challenges really in his life up to that point. If you think about it, I mean, there were the temptations as we are, but really life had been without that level of challenge because now he's going to face something that was way beyond anything that he could have imagined being literally cut off from the father to experience death. And the only way to experience that would be cut off, which is why he says, Abba, Abba, why have you forsaken me? He wasn't forsaken. He's like, where are you? I, I've never been disconnected from you. So it says again that he was 
Uh, he learned obedience by what he suffered, and having been perfected, he became the causer of everlasting deliverance to all those obeying him. So he's showing us the obedience path to deliverance. Deliverance through trust obedience. Emunah. Emunah is the Hebrew word for faith, trust, belief, where you understand that everything completely is in the control, the allowance, or the causality of the creator. He either allows it or causes it because it will serve his purpose, even, in, even if you don't see how that's possible. So he, now remember, this is that case being made for Yeshua. Everything in these chapters is trying to make the case for the role Yeshua has as high priest. This is not about him being Messiah. The book starts off with the acknowledgement that everybody who's, who's reading this book knows he's Messiah. They understand Messiah. But you got to remember, even today, the Jewish people see Messiah differently than the Christian people see it, differently than we see it, necessarily. So recognizing him as Messiah wasn't the problem. Recognizing the fullness of what that means. What is the role? What does that look like? Look, this was a problem even in Messiah Yeshua's day when the zealots expected Messiah, and the Jews to some degree today, some of them feel this way, that if Messiah were here, he would set the Jews free, set them up on the hill, wipe out all their enemies. It would be this, like a Moses, okay? They're looking for another Moses-type character. And then really like a King David who was out there you know, fighting against the Amalekites and the Hittites and all the other ites and setting things straight. As opposed to the fullness of what we understand Mashiach to be. He says, and having been perfected, now what perfected him? Learning obedience. You guys are going to hate me, okay? Which is fine. But you're going to say, Rabbi, how come that rabbi guy, he always turns it back to the same thing. I'm just reading it to you. Wherever we go, it comes back to the same thing. We struggle with obedience. All the way back to what? I don't know. Let's see. Adam. <laughs> Chava, we struggle with obedience. He said, don't eat. They ate. Nothing's changed in all those years, 6,000 years. We're still struggling with obedience. But notice he says this. He says, he said, through being a son, he learned obedience. Ah, wait a minute. Through, though being a son. Some of you, I, I don't know, I, I read that before, now all of a sudden the, the Ruach wants me to stop. Though being a son. Some of you think you've arrived you think you've made it. Well, I'm a child of the living Elohim. He said, though you may think that, don't feel entitled. Don't feel, you know, that you're just able to do stuff that you're, I'm entitled now, I'm a son. This is Christianity's biggest flaw. I'm, I believe in Messiah, so now I'm entitled to a bunch of stuff like eternal life. Don't feel entitled. He says, though being a son, he certainly could have felt entitled, he learned obedience by what he suffered. What was the temptations that the enemy gave him in the desert? You, you're suffering, so why don't you just create food for yourself? Or you're suffering, why don't you do this or that? Why don't you just take authority and rulership right now? I'll give it all to you. Because the enemy knew at that point the journey towards the suffering really was just beginning. And Yeshua, he's like, why do you need to go through all that? I'll just give you the kingdom now. You don't need to suffer and go through all that. And when he was in the trial, and at the trial he said, I could call a legion of angels. That wouldn't be a pretty picture. Wouldn't be a fair fight either, would it? But yet... He said, nope, it is right that I suffer. So I get what? Perfected through obedience. So having been perfected by overcoming the entitlement, overcoming the issues with disobedience or any kind of rebelliousness at all, but coming into full submission, having been designated by Elohim, Anointing from above, not self-anointing, self-appointing. Having been designated by Elohim, a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Concerning whom we have much to say and hard to explain. 
See, that's where the problem is. Christianity, they won't embrace some of those verses like that to talk about that some things are not easy to explain. There's a lot to be said about it, and right now, up to this point, there's almost nothing in the scriptures that's actually really been said about Melchizedek or Melchizedek. Melchizedek is really a conjunctive word. It's two words together, which is the idea of being a king, Malki, and Tzadik, a righteous king. Okay? And so actually it's funny because in the book of Yashar, he's called Adonai Zedek. Okay, or the Lord of righteousness, the master of righteousness, someone who has mastered righteousness. Okay, Adonai Zedek. Okay, not that I'm recommending that, you know, we need to go pull the book of Yashar into all of this, but I'm just saying is, it's just an interesting thing that is pointed out there, that it gets translated as Adonai Zedek. All right, so continuing, it says here, concerning whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. Now notice that it's not just that it's a lot to say and it's hard to explain. It's hard to explain mostly because you have a hearing problem. How do you become dull of hearing? What is dull of hearing? Could it be that you've become complacent or jaded or think you know it all or you've heard it all before or you figured it all out so now you're not ready to receive new insight or new understanding or clarity or clarification, dull of hearing. Because I've met many people, especially coming out of certain denominational factions, that have a really hard time with their pride of thinking that we were so smart. Okay? And you can know who some of those are. I don't know, I need to name them off. But some of the sects of Christianity especially have a problem where they think they're smarter than all the other denominations. And they've already arrived in their thinking. And when I run into them, they are very dull of hearing. Very hard to share anything with them that does not line up with what they already think they know. Okay? He says, concerning whom we have much to say and hard to explain because you have become dull of hearing. So he's talking to people like, yeah, you know a little bit, you know some, you know this, you know that. You know, there was um, a reason I needed to go and do some research recently. And in that research, I looked up a, a movie that was produced a little while back called The Way. I'm not picking on it, I don't love it, I don't hate it, whatever. But I was surprised in the interviews to find out that the people who produced it had a whopping year and a half experience at Torah observance. No, not picking on them, but that might be a little premature to put a movie out representing something that you've only been doing for a year and a half. That's what they said in the interview when they were asked, well, how long have you been walking this out? Whatever, year and a half, about. But this is the problem, is the leadership, the, those who are on the quote-unquote leading edge of whatever we're doing here are often people who have no... I don't even know what the word, no grounding. It takes years to figure out that you don't know what you thought you knew. In other words, you, you, I've talked to children about this. When I'm the teenagers, when we have conferences, I say, you know, when I'm working with the Gadol class, Gadol means big, this is the teenagers, like 13, 18, and I say, you guys are in a very strange place. You're not children anymore, but you're not adults, and your biggest problem is that you don't know what you don't know. You think you know but you're too young to have enough life to realize that you don't know the things that you think you know. A lot of us are still struggling with that because we've become dull of hearing. So even though you could have learned the things that you should know but didn't know, but you wouldn't receive it because of being dull of hearing. I talk to people all the time when they interact with me, and I, it's a hard thing. to say. I say, look, I've got much to say, and it's hard to explain. I'm going to use that line next time I'm on the phone in a conference call. By the way, I've got much to say, but it's hard to explain. Because you're dull of hearing. <laughs> They're not going to like that. I have to find a better way to say it. Okay. Some of you are thinking, no, Rabbi's going to say it exactly that way. And I probably will. Okay. If it's the right person who I think can handle it. But that's where the struggle is, isn't it? Because the dull of hearing is I think I already know, so I can't really receive he says, for indeed, now listen how this kind of flows forward here. 
okay? And actually, I just want to mention before we go forward, because I'm going to hit another element here. So this Melchizedekian thing, just so you have the reference, is, is from Genesis 14, 18 to 20. We see Melchizedek and Abram. This is before he even changes his name to Abraham, okay? So this is the first reference, and really the only reference to Melchizedek that you see there, and it is also the first reference to the Kiddush and Motzi, the wine and the bread. All right, just so you have that in your notes in case you're looking for it, it's Genesis 14, verses 18 through 20. We don't need to turn there, okay? Now, so it says here, for indeed, verse 12, chapter 5, right? For indeed, although by this time you ought to be teachers, so now it's again, the dull of hearing who think they're so smart, who, who think that they've arrived, he's saying, look, at, by this point, you ought to be teachers. But yet you need someone to teach you again the first elements of the words of Elohim. And you have become such as need milk and not solid food. So when we think of milk and solid food, what do you think of? A little baby, right? Babies don't eat solid food right away. There's a period of time where they're being weaned from their mother or they're getting what a kind of a formula, whatever we give them, but it's liquid because their body can't process and handle solid food yet. He says, for everyone partaking of milk is experiencing the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. For everyone partic partaking of the milk is inexperienced, excuse me, on the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. If you're drinking the milk, if you're still on the milk, you are inexperienced. A year and a half, three years, even five years, probably still qualifies as inexperienced. Okay? And there's nothing wrong with being a babe. Children need to wean on milk. They've got to have the milk. The babes need to have that. But solid food is for the mature whose senses have been trained by practice to discern both good and evil. That takes time. Problem is, most of the body is running around in a very immature state. They're not mature enough emotionally. They're not mature enough in their practicing and their interacting with the word and with applying it. They just have a, uh, they're still the babes, you know, who are, or they're actually choking on the milk still. Okay, so Hebrews 5, 12 to 14 is making the point that understanding this difference. Now remember, now let's connect it to what he was just talking about. He's talking about the Melchizedekian priesthood. He's talking about the role of Messiah. He's talking about comparing it to the Aaronic priesthood. And he's trying to tell you that this difference should be basically milk. That this should not be a meat issue. But you don't understand the first elements of the words of Elohim. You're struggling with these things. Because some of us really still struggle with the milk. We're choking on it. We're dull of hearing. So verse 12, he says, by this time you ought to be teachers. So what did they lack? Why were they inexperienced, unskilled, ignorant? What was going on? They needed someone to teach them, to keep them grounded in their understanding so that they could become mature, complete, through practice, training in the discernment of good and evil. They needed someone to teach them them. This is why Paul talks about in Ephesians the need for teachers until we all come into the fullness and completeness of Yeshua, which is the maturity and all the other levels of that, where he lists the fivefold, quote unquote, it doesn't actually call it that anywhere, that's a Christian thing, he calls it the fivefold ministry, but that's where he lists the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the teachers and the shepherds, okay? And so... We need them, why? Because they will help to keep us grounded in our understanding so that we can mature, become complete through practice and training in the discernment of good and evil. So let's go back to what good and evil is. What is good and evil? Good is defined by Yahweh is everything that's in line with what he designed it to be. When he made everything in Genesis 1, he said, and it was good. All right? Now, we also have evil. What is evil? When something that he designed to be one way is either being used completely in a different way, being bent, twisted, perverted, or whatever, or the opposite is being done, etc. That's called evil. 
Let's not limit the idea of evil. I say this a lot, but we just, maybe every teaching it comes up, it needs to be said. Let's not limit evil to, you know, pedophiles, rapists, murderers, you know, genocidal maniacs, homicidal maniacs. I mean, those are obvious evil, okay? On the other hand, it's also evil to take a Torah command and bend it or twist it or pervert it to your own benefit that goes against what Yahweh said. These all still fall in the category of evil. But there needs to be the maturing and the practice and the training so that you practice in understanding how to discern the difference. Now, I don't think most of us have a problem discerning that murder, rape, you know, obvious evil things. We don't have a problem with that. No, it's the subtleties where the obedience thing comes into play. We almost always, once we, look, let's, let's all, we, we'll acknowledge that we've had former lives. So we're not talking about that life that you lived. But since coming to truth, to Torah, to Yeshua, to the way, into covenant, mostly we've gotten the obvious evil things handled. Where, so what evil problems do you run into? The ones where your obedience becomes a problem. I don't really want to do it exactly the way he said to do it, so I'm going to interpret it conveniently in my favor. So either A, I don't have to do it, or I'll do it my own way or something. That's the evil problem. And remember, this is still linked to where he said that he was perfected through obedience. Let's connect all those dots. Context flows through this whole thing so that by the time we get to this, we're still choking on the milk. In other words, we still struggle with obedience even to the milk. Because even with the milk, we become dull of hearing. Yeah, yeah, blah, blah. You know, a lot of you still listen to these teachings and get excited about it, even though I've said the same thing over and over. And quite frankly, if you listen to the teachings, almost every teaching is the same. I say the same thing every week because the book says the same thing every week, more or less. And so you can sit there going, yeah, yeah, blah, blah, I've heard that, I've heard that. Dull of hearing. What you should be saying is, is this an issue for me somewhere because I've let myself get to the place where it sounds to me like blah, blah, blah. It's not in my notes, but we're going to go there for a second. First Peter, no, second Peter. All right. In second Peter, see, this is one of those Ruach things again. I wasn't going to go there, and all of a sudden it was remembered. This is why we have Peter telling us this. He goes, and so I intend to remind you of these matters. And he just went through a whole bunch of matters in the beginning of the chapter of things that they should understand. Like he talks to them saying, verse 4, through these there have been to us exceedingly great and precious promises so that through these you might be partakers in the mighty like nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by lust. For this reason do your utmost to add to your belief uprightness, to uprightness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control endurance, to endurance reverence, to reverence brotherly affection, etc. He gave them all this stuff and he said, but I intend to remind you of these matters again and again and again though you should already know them. Actually, he doesn't even say should. He says, though you know them. He acknowledges, you already know this stuff and have been established in them in the present truth, but he's afraid you might become dull of hearing. But I think it is right, as long as I am in this body, in this tent, to stir you up by a reminder. This is really the problem. Are you becoming dull of hearing? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, Rabbi, you've said that 800 times. Well, maybe you need to hear it 801 times. You know. It's like the joke I've told many times. I don't remember where I heard it from, where, you know, rabbi gets up there, gives a sermon. Everybody thinks it's great. Next week comes back, gives the same sermon again. But, you know, it was still great. I mean, after all, hearing it the same. A good, some of you have heard, you know, some of the teachings three, four, five times. You don't mind, right? Come back the next week, same sermon again. They're going, okay, still good, but maybe Alzheimer's or something's going on. The rat, well, does he not realize he gave the same sermon three weeks in a row? All right, we'll give him one more week. Fourth week, same exact sermon. Now they're like, somebody needs to say something. So they go and they get a bunch of guys over and say, Rabbi, we don't want to be disrespectful. We just happened to notice he gave the same sermon for four weeks. We're a little bit concerned. I don't know what's going on. He said, aha. He says, you noticed. They said, yeah. Well, what's up? He said, well, when you start doing it, I'll stop saying it. 
That's kind of what the Scripture's doing. Yahweh's saying the same thing here in Hebrews that he said in Genesis, that he said in Numbers, that he said in Isaiah, that he said in Hosea, that he said in Chronicles, that he said in Matthew. The message doesn't change. That's why we're able to jump from verse to verse in different books, and they're saying the same thing. Peter is saying the exact same thing in 2 Peter that we just addressed in Hebrews, the concern with becoming dull of hearing. All right. So I just added that in there. So let's go back to Hebrews. Okay, so we know that they needed someone to teach them and keep them grounded in their understanding so that they would become mature. So the problem really was, and that's really why it was a good thing in a tragedy that they were about to lose the temple system because what was going to happen going forward is that those in the Melchizedekian role were going to take the forefront again. You had Melchizedekian priests leading the the leading the cause, so to speak, up until Aaron with Moses. Doesn't say that what I'm about to say, but I'm going to give you my understanding speculation. You have Moses as the Melchizedekian priest. Now, he happened to be Levite also, like his brother. But the Melchizedekian priesthood we're going to see coming up doesn't have a genealogy factor. You must be a son of Aaron to be a Levitical Kohen. You do, it doesn't matter your genealogy and it matters your anointing and appointing from whoever was a previous anointed, appointed, etc. It gets passed down. Your genealogy is irrelevant. So Moses passes to the next one, which is who? Yehoshua. What tribe was Yehoshua from? Okay, so Yehoshua was not Levitical. And he wasn't, so he wasn't from the same line as, as Moses. And so, so we have a tribal thing is not relevant. Genealogy is not relevant to the Melchizedekian. But what was the Melchizedekian role? We've talked about this before. We'll talk about it in this teaching because we're going to really get into the Melchizedekian thing here in a little bit. The role was instruction, counsel, and judging from the point of like decision-making on how to apply the halakha. The Levitical priesthood was the temple service. They were there responsible to do the rituals of the temple as well as they had judicial you know, related issues as well. So like Moses' role, when people would come to Moses, Moses then was then instructed by his father-in-law, but the idea of sharing that burden with others to make decisions. But what happened when the 70 got the anointing that was on Moses, which of course irritated Joshua at no end. <laughs> he did not like that they were doing what Moses was doing. But it says that they were doing what Moses had been doing, which was what? Prophesying. This is the definition. Make a note of it. Remember it. Memorize it. Prophecy is speaking the word of Yahweh with authority. It is not speaking the future in sort of... That doesn't mean the future speaking is not part of it. When we read Ezekiel, Isaiah, Hosea, and they talk about the future, and we read that with authority to help remind people, cry aloud, spare not, that is part of the word. Moses does tell everybody, and when you mess this all up, and you're in the land, and you then get thrown into the... Scattered to the Gentiles, etc. That's speaking the future. But primarily, it's the instructions. Speaking the instructions to the people with authority. The word, the Torah. That was coming not from the Levites. The Levites were looking to how to apply certain parts of it, mostly to deal with the, the rituals and the understandings of Tameh and Tahor. So you went to a priest to find out if you were somehow Tameh. And then that's why Yeshua, even when he healed the lepers, he said, go do what Moses told you. Go show yourself to the priest. So issues of Tameh and Tahor, specifically, which is the, in Hebrew is the clean and unclean. Okay, I should actually unclean and clean because Tameh is unclean, Tahor is clean. So unclean and clean, Tameh and Tahor. You mostly see that with the Levitical priesthood. Issues of your house has something on it, your clothing has something on it, you go to the priest. But when it comes to the other halakhic walking things, which you read like in Deuteronomy 17, when there's a matter between you and your brother and we don't know how to rule on it, those other rulings that really weren't about clean and unclean, you went to the, the leadership. Okay, often it was the king, the elders, those that were in charge. Now it could be the priest if there wasn't anybody else around, but generally that was more of a Melchizedekian thing. And so here we're seeing the distinction as it starts to lay out between the two. 
And so when he says that there was a need to have someone to teach them, this is why they were, they were not mature, they were untrained and unpracticed in the discernment, is that there was not a whole lot of Melchizedekian instruction going on. Oh, there was a temple, there was a priesthood, and for the most part, everybody else was kind of let loose. A lot of people have this idea that there were rabbis walking around everywhere. Not necessarily so. There were teachers. That, again, there were even people that don't like the term rabbi. You know what the term rabbi was? It wasn't even hardly even used in Yeshua's day. Look that up. You'll see in all the Jewish writings. The first time it was ever used was around the mid-first century, which is right around the time that Yeshua had already been dead. Now, by the way, when something is used for the first time, that doesn't mean all of a sudden everybody's using it. The common use doesn't come, believe it or not, to what? After the destruction of the temple, and people were now looking to this other leadership for guidance, and that's where you see the emergence of the authority of rabbis. Because the priesthood isn't there. And so that really doesn't come until, into real prominence until after the destruction of the temple in 70. Okay? Now, so this case is being made for the Melchizedekian. We're told that they're having trouble with this milk element. Hold on here. We're going to read more about the milk and the meat. Let's go to 1 Peter 2. Oh, let's see, we were there, and now we need to go back there. 1 Peter 2, verse 1. Having put aside then all evil, all deceit, and hypocrisies and envyings and all evil words as newborn babes. Okay, so notice the flow there. He's not even thinking of you as a newborn babe until you've actually decided to put aside evil, deceit, hypocrisy, envyings, all these other things. That's the beginning, is that you recognize I'm wrong, right? You have to recognize that you're wrong. I am wrong. So I get to put all that stuff aside. Newborn babes. Now listen, he says, desiring the unadulterated word, milk of the word, in order that you grow by it. So you recognize that you're wrong, and now you're desiring what you need to feed on for sustenance. Think about the babe on his mother's breast. What is the babe there? It's the sustaining of life. Without the milk from mom, that baby will die. Now, of course, we have things now like man-made products, but they didn't have that back then. The best they could do is maybe use some goat's milk. Okay, But without the milk, the baby would die. It's sustaining life. So it's saying here, I'm recognizing that the evil that I've been doing, the deceit, the hypocrisy, the envyings, all these other th stuff was leading me towards what? Death. But I need life. So as a newborn babe, I'm going to desire the unadulterated milk. Problem is, most people out there are teaching adulterated milk. That's evil, by the way, because they're perverting, twisting, and misrepresenting the milk of the word. But, they, but we desire the unadulterated milk. Funny thing is, it's like you know, the line from, from, from A Few Good Men where it says, well, you can't handle the truth. Because people will say, all I want is the truth. Well, that sounds real nice, and I applaud you. And I'm not doing that mockingly. I do applaud you for wanting the truth. Because I've had people have a conversation with me, and because a lot of you wonder, like, you know, well, I wonder how many people rabbis brought to the truth. Or, probably not a whole lot in my conversations with people privately, because I don't share as much as you might think I would, because I don't like to argue with people. So I ask them questions like, where are you in your walk? Are you happy? And when they tell me, oh, I am walking in favor. I am just so in my relationship with Messiah and all this other stuff. And I have this great church I go to. And man, we just get into the word and we just love the truth. And I'm not going to disturb their peace. They are not ready. He's got to disturb their peace. And then they ask me about stuff and I say, that's okay. Let's talk about something else. And I find a way kind of to just give them a very light answer. Hey, we're just on a different page about some things, you know. Because it's only going to lead to an argument and fight. Now, sometimes they push more, and then I'll say, okay. I said, but I'm telling you, oh, no, no, I can handle it. I'm, you know, I'm mature, and I, you know, I, we, I'm a truth seeker. Really? Well, put that to the test. I got a red pill here for you. Okay. Should we read anything in from the color code why there's a red pill for reality and the blue pill wants to stay in the delusion? Okay, never mind. 
Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, never mind. <laughs> I, I already said it, so too bad. Okay, here we go. All right, told you, no filter. All right, so, but they think they want the truth, okay? They think they want the truth. The unadulterated milk of the word in order that they grow by it. If indeed, now listen, he says, you put away these things, you're a newborn babe, you desire the unadulterated milk of the word in order that you go by it, if, you only do this if indeed you have tasted that the master is good. Now, by the way, in that verse, he just connected that the milk of the word and the word itself is the master. Like we taught you, Yeshua is the word, Yeshua is the truth, the truth made flesh, the Torah made flesh, etc. That he is that, Okay? And he just connected the two together. You desire the unadulterated milk of the word. If indeed you have tasted of the master that he is good, that's why you've tasted of it. You want to drink more. You want to to suckle on that. You want to be weaned on that. So let's remember that. Then he goes on to say, drawing near to him a living stone rejected indeed by men, but chosen by Elohim. Again, he's reiterating what we see in Hebrews, that this is one who was chosen by Elohim and precious, You also, as living stones, are being built up. A spiritual house is set-apart priesthood. Ah, so now these people are being set up as a set-apart priesthood. They cannot be Levitical. What, is he talking to only Kohanes? Only people with the genealogy of Aaron? Or of Levi? No. He's saying to all of them that they can be a set-apart priesthood to offer up spiritual slaughtering offers, except of Elohim, through the Melchizedekian high priest, Yeshua Messiah. Now, it doesn't say that in there, but it does. So that's how we understand this. This is a different priesthood. So we're told, well, yeah, it says we're supposed to be a kingdom of priests, not Levitical ones. We're going to be a kingdom of Melchizedekian ones who are able to speak the word of Yahweh with authority, which you cannot do if you don't know it with authority. If you're still sitting there sucking on a baby bottle with dirty diapers and not knowing what you're doing. Okay? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul also talks about having a challenge with milk. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and in verse 1. And I, brothers, was not able to speak to you as to spiritual ones, but as to fleshly, as to babes and Messiah. He's telling you that when you're a babe, you're still fleshly. Oh, that was insulting, Rabbi. I didn't say it. Paul did. Get mad at me. So what what would make them still fleshly? They don't have the maturity yet and the training and the practice to discern good from evil. So they're still filtering through the flesh. They're not fleshly, meaning that they're still out there carousing and living the wild life necessarily, but they're taking what's being given to them through their flesh filter. And therefore, they're then still twisting and bending it to their own advantage of their personal preferences. He said... I was not able to speak to you as spiritual ones, but as to fleshly, as to babes. Because as a babe, you're still mostly flesh. Because you don't know what you don't know. We should make a shirt about that. That's kind of like, you know, I don't know what I don't know yet. I mean, I mean, that's, I mean that, whatever it is. You need to get to the point where you recognize that there may be still things in your life that you don't know that you don't know. That's a journey. That's a lifelong journey of figuring out that you don't know what you think you know. Remember, I used to talk about Messianics Anonymous. Hi, my name is Steve, and I don't know as much as I think I know. That's what we should all get up and say. Right now, you have to get up, give your name, and admit you're an alcoholic or admit you have a drug problem. Well, You have to start off by admitting you don't know as much as you think you know. That should be Messianics Anonymous. (laughs) Okay. Hi, my name is, and I don't know as much as I think I know. Because we all think we're so smart. And we know more than everybody. Everybody thinks they're all got it all figured out. Verse 2, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it because it was going through the flesh filter. And even now you're still not able. (laughs) 
you imagine reading, having this read to you and you're in a Corinthian congregation? Come on, Paul, give us a little more credit than that. You know. He says, for you are still fleshly. See, I don't think my interpretation is off at all. They're having a problem with the flesh filter. But he says this, is like, look, there's envies and strife and divisions among you. Are, not, are you not fleshly and walking according to man when you do those things? Anyway, so let's go back to Hebrews. Back to chapter 5. And we're going to back to finishing it up. So you see, this is what Peter said. This is what Shaul said. This is what Paul said. So let's go back and read what Hebrews says again. He says, look, for indeed, although by this time, verse 12, you ought to be teachers. Now remember, even in the four-step process I've given you for understanding a topic, A, you need to understand it. Then you need to be able to do it. Then you need to be able to defend it. And then after maturing through that whole process, you should be able to teach it. He said, look, by this time, these are people who have been doing this a while. He said, you should be teachers. But you still need someone to teach you again the first elements, the basics of the words of Elohim. Now, he's going to go further on into chapter 6 and other places to kind of put some of those things out there that may be according to the basics. He says, and you have not become, excuse me, and you have become such as need milk and not solid food. For everyone partaking of milk, partaking of milk is inexperienced in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So he's saying, look, even though you think you've arrived, you think you've put the time in, you think you've got all of the credentials, he says, you're still acting like a newborn babe. So it's not just a chronological thing where you can tick off time going, well, I've been doing this for 10 years. I had a guy get in my face he was probably in his 70s, maybe almost 80, and say to me, banging on his Bible, I've read this book 47 times, probably over 47 years or whatever he read it in those cycles. I said, okay, but time itself doesn't make you right. He could have read it with dull ears the same way he's always read it, hearing his pastor's voice in his head the same way he's always heard it, and all he did was entrain himself into that way of thinking, So he's saying, look, you guys, yeah, you've been doing this a while. And by this time, you ought to be teachers. But you're not. You're still acting like you're inexperienced in the word. Because solid food is for the mature. So he's telling them your problem is you're not mature. You don't have the senses that have been trained by practice. So they're not practicing. Remember what we talk about over and over and over and over and over. Information is what knowing is if it's just on that non-practice level. He wants relational knowing. These are people that had informational knowing. But through practice, through tasting of the master, like we read in Peter, the tasting of the master, we get a relational knowing. And then, you've been, then they would have been trained by practice to discern both good and evil. So you know the difference. Notice that the tree that they ate of was a tree of having a relationship with both good and evil, not an informational knowing of the differences. That's where the confusion is. Well, I've often felt this when I first came into this, and I'm sure you felt exactly the same way. At some point, you had this thought, what was so wrong with wanting to know the difference in good and evil? Why was it so bad that they ate of that tree? Anybody have that thought? I mean, really, you're thinking, other than the fact that Yahweh said not to, shouldn't we know what's good and what's evil? He wasn't talking about information. He said, do not participate by eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They're having a relationship with both. That's a mixing that's not allowed. Having a relationship with evil as opposed to just information about it. Of course he wants you to know informationally what's each one so that you can practice and know the difference and know how to avoid the one and do the other. Do what's good, avoid the evil. He says, but you have to be trained and you have to practice to have the discernment between the two. When we read this, before we get into chapter six, well, I think we can get into it a little bit, okay? Let's understand that he's trying to give people a sense that, look, as I'm taking you through this journey, I'm making a case for Messiah Yeshua as high priest, I'm trying to give you 
new information that's not necessarily new. You should have had it, but you had to know how, how to discern it and piece it together. You didn't know what to do with this whole Melchizedekian thing, so I'm giving you this information. Recognize that you are still a babe, and you have to humble yourself to receive what I'm about to give you going forward. Because he's telling them this now before it gets really heavy. He's saying, don't be dull of hearing. Don't think you've figured it all out. I'm about to blow your head up with some stuff that you should know, but you're not going to understand if you don't have open ears and open eyes and aren't ready to receive. All right? Let's go into chapter 6. I have a little bit of time here. We'll get a little bit into chapter 6. Verse 1, he says, therefore, and that's where these chapter breaks really become a problem because really this flows exactly out of verse 14 from chapter 5. Therefore, because of everything I just said about being immature, being a babe, not being ready, and all these other things, having a struggle with having not been perfected by learning obedience, etc. Therefore, having left the word of the beginning of the Messiah, let us go on to perfection. He says, let's get off the milk. Having left the word of the beginning of Messiah, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and a belief towards Elohim. No, <laughs> okay. What do we repent of? What do you repent of? Sin, right? Okay, so what is sin? When you do a dead work, a work that leads to death, a work that is not fruitful. So let's realize that Christianity has tried to use this verse to tell you that the Torah has been dead works. You don't repent of Torah. You repent when you break Torah. He says, the beginning of the foundation of Messiah that we don't have to lay again is that you repent of your dead works. You repent of breaking the Torah. You repent. He said, I don't need to lay that again. You should know that you don't need to be retaught about repenting. You need to repent. You should know that already. From dead works, works that lead to death, fruitless works, and of belief towards Elohim. Why? Because if, if the dead works is the Torah that we have to get away from, then why are we also not saying that we have to get away from believing in Elohim? What were dead works? Well, I don't know, Sunday worship, paganism, Baal worship, you know, you know, Kemosh, whatever it is that you thought was getting, having special amulets, your rosary beads and all that. I mean, these are dead works that you thought was going to get you somewhere. Idols, saying the name exactly right. That's a problem even in the body now with the, with the whole sacred name movement where if I say the name exactly right, some magic is going to happen. Okay, that's dead works. Okay, he says, look, we should not have to lay again the foundation of repentance from doing dumb things that don't really have the fruit that we think they should or that we expected them to have. He says, and we're not going to have to lay again the foundation of belief towards Elohim of the teaching of immersions, like why you have to get baptized, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of everlasting judgment. In other words, we don't have to reteach you all the basic stuff. He says, but we can, and this we shall do if Elohim indeed permits. Because again, he said, I recognize that you guys need a teacher. Okay, so now, there's our foundation right there. Dead works are the fruitless efforts we made in our ignorance. Now here's a real problematic verse. For it is, in, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened to have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the set-apart spirit and have tasted the good word of Elohim and the powers of the age to come and fall away to renew them again to repentance, having impaled for themselves the son of Elohim again and put him to open shame. So we're going to stop here. No, I'm kidding. You guys are like, oh, I've always wanted to understand, like, because that talks about... Like, what is the cardinal sin, the, that thing that you can't be forgiven of, and blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's break this down. Okay, the word impossible there can perhaps be better trace, uh, translated as incapable. Okay? It is impossible, or the people who have done these things are not capable, once they've been enlightened and tasted of the gift, but now they've rejected it, of repentance. In other words, they've made a decision. They've made a rejection. It's not like it's impossible that if they want to, they have lost the ability to go that route. He's saying, look, if you're dull long enough and you go the wrong route long enough, you won't want to repent. You'll become incapable of it. The Greek word allows for that translation as a better translation than necessarily impossible. 
Now it continues into verse 6. It says, And having tasted the word of Elohim and the powers of the age to come, and fall away to renew them again in repentance, having impaled for themselves the cell of Elohim again, and put him to open shame. So look, the put him to shame, the him in the Greek is unclear who it's referring to. Perhaps it is referring to the one who was impaled for him, who has impaled for himself. In other words, it's saying, look, are you impaling Yeshua again? Or are you appalling yourself? In other words, you are killing yourself. You're putting yourself to shame because of what you're doing. Who is being put to shame here? It says, fall away to renew a sense, um, to having impaled for themselves the son of Elohim, again, to put who? To open shame. In other words, why did Yeshua get impaled? Because we all sinned. So every time you sin, you're really actually causing him to have to be impaled. You're causing, even though he did it once for all, but you are again a reason for him to do that. And who are you putting to shame, him or yourself? You're putting yourself to shame. So these are people that are putting themselves to shame. In other words, they have rejected Messiah because he had embraced a similar mindset as those that have rejected and impaled Yeshua. In other words, these are people that are acting like those. Remember, this is very close to the time when there were people still alive I should say it was close to the time when they were still, there were people still alive who were there who rejected Yeshua, who said, kill him, we want Barabbas. They rejected him. He says, these are people that are rejecting Yeshua. So in rejecting, he's saying they're going to become incapable of repentance. They are embracing their rejection. So it's not saying once you've heard the truth and been enlightened and then you reject it, you can't turn around and repent. Of course you can but at some point, you're going to become incapable of it. That's the person we're talking about here. The person that at some point will dull their hearing to the point where they will become incapable of repenting. Does that make more sense now? Are we getting clear here? Because a lot of you are worried about, well, I've got friends that understood this, and then they sort of went in a different direction. That doesn't mean they're still not able to repent and come back. Lots of people have gone on that journey. I got that T-shirt, Okay. All right? And now I've been teaching you guys for eight years since I repented, so to speak, came to be re-enlightened, whatever the words you want to go through to be able to do what I'm doing now. But there are those who would say, oh, no, according to Hebrews, you can't possibly be. That's not what it's talking about here. It's trying to remember in the whole process here, it's the idea these are people that should know better. They've not been perfected by obedience. They are still having a problem with dull hearing, verse 11 from the previous chapter. They're stuck on the milk. They're having issues with the meat, etc. And that at some point, because of their inability to be open to hear and to grow and learn, and their rejecting of the truth and Messiah, etc., they will become incapable of the repentance process. Okay? The one who tasted of the good word and then rejected Yeshua in such a manner would certainly bring open shame to themselves. Also, they would bring open shame to Messiah because they would have identified themselves publicly with Messiah prior to rejecting him. That's what's going on in this verse. He's saying to them, like, look, you people who are freaking out, who are dull hearing, who should already be teachers... You have, you've accepted Messiah. You claim to be of Messiah. Be careful what you're doing. You, you can bring yourself to shame, and you can also embarrass your Messiah. What do we say in the eighth declaration when you go in the water? That you are, you are committing to walk out your life in such a way as to bring the names Yahweh and Yeshua, glory and honor, and not shame. It's a public declaration. If you're wearing your seat seat, that's your public declaration. I am of Messiah. Be careful what you say and do when you're wearing them. Otherwise, you can bring him shame. And so verse, let's read this again. Therefore, having left, back to verse 1. Oh, we got to do this quick. Having left the word from the, of the beginning of Messiah, let us go to perfection, not laying again the foundation of all these basic things. He says, for it is, in, is a person is not capable, once they've been enlightened and having tasted of the heavenly gift, and having tasted of the good word of Elohim, verse 5, and fall away to renew them again to repentance. Because they've impaled for themselves the son of Elohim again and put him to open shame. Hmm. It's a warning. He's warning people. He's saying, look, be careful where you go. You may get to the point where you will have no possibility of repenting. If you are 
in your heart drawn to repentance, it's not too late. That's the point of repentance. Because I will get email after email and phone call after phone call from people who feel like they're never going to get in because what they did was so terrible and they did believe at one point and then they rejected or they did this or they did that. Are you sorry you did it? Yes. Do you repent? Yes. Guess what? You have not violated what's talking about here in chapter 6. You will get to the point, however, where you are no longer capable of feeling bad, feeling sorry for what you've done. That's when you've become guilty of all this stuff. That's when this will apply. If your heart breaks and you mourn and you're sad and you, are, uh, you feel guilty of what you've done and you wish you could fix it, uh, go back to the repentance teaching. I'm sorry for what I did. If possible, I wish I could undo it. Whatever I could do to fix it, I want to do it right now. And please help me never do it again. As long as you can say those things and mean it, this is not a problem. Do not apply chapter 6 to you. You haven't gotten there yet. But chapter 6 warns you that if you don't get to this point where you start really fixing these things, the repetitive behavior pattern will get you to the point where you will give up and give in and not repent. You will become incapable of the repentance. Do we fix it? As far as understanding that this has been used in such a terrible way, I've got people who have depression issues and psychoemotional issues where they're fragile, and I'm not picking on them at all, who struggle mightily that somehow they've blown it. Christianity always wanted you to think about you could blow it. Just do this or that or the other thing, and you blew it. No, there's nothing you can do to blow it as long as you recognize that you're blowing it. You understand what I'm saying? You're messing it up, and you can repent. As long as there's a breath in you and a thought in you to be sorry for what you did, you haven't blown it. This isn't Catholic confession where as long as you go and say you're whatever. No, I mean you have to truly in your heart regret the behavior and desire to fix it. As long as you're still capable of doing that, you're fine. But just do it. If you're, just because you're capable of it and don't do it, now you still have to repent. Let's hopefully we understand this. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we come before you. And we, wow, we got a lot here that we're just starting to unravel as we get into chapter 6 and then into 7 and 8. And so, Father, we, we just especially want to embrace that we not become dull of hearing, that, Father, we understand that it's through obedience that we are perfected, and that, Father, that may we never become incapable of repenting. May we never be so set and satisfied and thinking we're so right that we cannot be corrected. And that's really what it's come to, and that's what is being said here in chapter 6 for everyone who's listening, and that's part of the prayer as well. He's saying, look, you could get to the point where you just think you're so right that you wouldn't repent because you think you're right. Those who impaled Yeshua thought they were right. So it's not that you know you're wrong, you're just being stubborn. You're just going to go ahead and be self-righteous and self, uh, through the flesh, filtering that you're not going to want to repent because you just think you're right. And you're not capable because you're going to be like those who impaled Yeshua thinking they were right. It says there will be those that will turn you in for death thinking they are right, doing Elohim's work. Father, help us, help us never, ever get to that place where we think we're right doing wrong. Help us to truly embrace the right mindset, to embrace what's being said here in the book of Hebrews, a book that is rejected by many. May we never do that. I think it's a great book. It gives us some tremendous information. Only problem is it's been twisted and perverted for so long that people do not recognize what you're saying through the writer of this book. Father, we love that you've given us these words. We love that you've given us information and instruction. May we always have open ears and open hearts and be ready to receive and not be dull of hearing. May we recognize that we need instruction and teachers and be always ready to then find that submissive place to receive the instruction. Father, we are humbly sitting at your feet, ready to repent of all things wrong and receive all things right, to recognize that we do not know what we do not know, that we are not as smart as we think we are, we don't know as much as we think we do, but we should be ready to be instructed in all things, all times. And so, Father, we thank you that you are in your mercy and your compassion. You allow us the space and the time to walk this life as we are practicing and training in our discernment of good and evil. Father, we thank you now 
We ask mercy and compassion continuously as we journey. We love you so much. We appreciate so much. As we submit ourselves to you in our growing process, and we do so in the authority of our Messiah and our High Priest, whose name is above all names, Yeshua, our Messiah. It's in his name we pray and we ask. Amen. Amen.